Hello and welcome to Social X, the podcast from Humentum. My name's George Miller, and I'm delighted to welcome as our guest today, Julian Stodd, who's a pioneering voice on social age thinking and a prolific author and thinker. Julian is also founder of Seasalt Learning, a global learning consultancy which is active in the fields of social learning, social leadership, culture and change, and learning design, which maps perfectly onto the key focus of this podcast. This podcast originates in Humentum's conviction that the power of global development community lies in professionals and experts collaborating towards social good. Helping enable that is at the core of Humentum Learning Services' mission too. So this podcast showcases that exchange, expertise and experience in a context that allows in-depth discussion and exploration, all hopefully in an informal setting. Julian, welcome to Social X. Hey, thanks for inviting me. So you've written a whole series of books exploring the social age, and we'll come on to, to discuss what you, what you mean by, by that phrase. You've written handbooks and guidebooks and workbooks looking at different aspects of leadership and learning and the organisation, and we can dig into some of those in this discussion. But I wanted to start with an aspect which might at first sight appear purely cosmetic, but I was really struck by. And that's the fact that you illustrate all your books and your blog posts yourself. And the more I explored your work, the more I came to see that the illustration wasn't just decoration, but it was actually part of the way that you explore the world and ideas and make those ideas approachable to people. And I think that's part, at least, of what makes it memorable, because you go on so many blogs and they've got stock photography and it just sort of, it sort of deadens the whole thing, whereas your illustration seemed to me to, to help bring the ideas alive. So I just wondered if you could say something about that characteristic and how you see it. Is it a sort of a tool that you use for exploring or is it mainly there to, to help people understand that the ideas you, that you've already sort of dug into? Well, it's, it's an interesting place to start. The, the, the thing I think I should say to begin with is that I, I have produced an awful lot of work and an awful lot of it isn't that good, which is okay, because the, 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 the key advantage I have in the space that I'm in is I have an almost unlimited permission to be wrong, because uh, I'm not really all that accountable to anybody at least in general terms. You know, if I come up with an idea, it invariably seems brilliant. Uh, sometimes I write it and illustrate it and work with it for a bit. And, you know, occasionally it's it's not bad at all. But quite often things just fade away. They, they gently change and iterate. And that's part of my process of working, a, a methodology called working out loud, where you where you, you know, the, the, the correct way to say it is you share your working, you share your work as it evolves. But what it really means is uh, you, you, you try to claim permission never to take the exam. So your, your, your thinking can be constantly evolutionary. Now, in that sense, all of my illustration is, is typically also sketched. So it's, it's not sort of beautiful and precise, which is funny because I, I come from a background of architectural drawing and detail. So I kind of I guess early in life came from that place of trying to use both my writing and um, illustration and indeed in my training as a, a scientist originally to sort of publish perfection as if that's possible. But now I've kind of wound that back. I'm in a much more informal, conversational, sketched space. So the illustration is very much part of my thinking. I normally write and illustrate every single day. Some of the ideas in my work you can trace back through 10 or 12 years of, of illustration and writing. Most days I come up with the idea and the idea of the illustration at the same time. And it's 50-50 whether I draw it first or write it first. But I almost never illustrate after the writing. Sometimes I'll start the writing. Like today I was writing a, a big and... Uh, to me, complex piece, trying to sort of explore one of the broadest ideas of the social age. And I started with this um, kind of amorphous shape in my head. I didn't know what it would look like, but I, it was lurking there. But I wrote the first few paragraphs of the article. Then I went and did the illustration. Then I went back and finished the article. Then I went back and produced 
two further illustrations that just adapted and, and took out the illustration. So that's kind of how I work through the illustration. And it's really interesting to hear you talk about how that works in tandem with the idea of working out loud, which I know has been um, inspirational to Humentum Learning Services, and they host a monthly working out loud session and ins- inspired by it. Because it's transparent and exploratory, provisional, speculative, I guess that might make some people feel rather nervous because, as you say, you're showing your workings, but you're all, you've also got to be prepared to show your, your mistakes or your, or your dead ends or the, the ideas which just never really take off. So yeah. is that something you think about how to help people overcome that initial trepidation when, they, when they're pre- presented with the idea of working out loud? It's generally worth remembering that most of our thoughts and most of our ideas become outdated over time. And so in the learning space, I've really seen this um, with the idea of learning styles. You know, learning styles are very much, you know, people who consider themselves learning professionals, and, you know, rightly so, are very disparaging about learning styles and learning styles research, and tend to disparage people who continue to talk about it, either because they uh, interpret the evidence differently, or simply because they've not yet learnt to look at the world in a different way. But I remember, you know, I used to very firmly believe in learning styles. I spent six years of my postgrad research trying to sort of make sense of it, trying to do something with it. It seemed like an eminently sensible idea. It fell into that dangerous trap of being very intellectually appealing. It felt like it should be right. So I kind of wanted to try to make it right. And so I think about that, you know, if I hadn't had the opportunity to make my mistakes, to learn, to evolve my thinking, not to pick up somebody else's thinking, but to evolve my practice. I'd never have moved beyond that. And any time that we judge others for their thinking, we essentially remove their permission to rehearse. And you cannot go from learning into performance without rehearsal. So that's how I see the the challenge. You know, for individuals, if you cannot claim or find or be given a rehearsal space, you are unlikely to be able to develop in your practice. But it's not just a responsibility or an onus on the individual to be brave enough. You know, it's funny that you use that word, because when you look at change, in in my research about change, people describe bravery and courage are the two key traits you need to be able to change, which is crazy. You know, if we want people to change, why do they have to be brave and courageous? But there's also an onus on those people who hold power or who hold a narrative to create that space and permission uh, to let other people make their journey. And to, to switch metaphors from the rehearsal space to the to the idea of a toolbox, this iterative approach, does it does it sort of reveal that certain tools are right for certain jobs at certain times, but maybe 10 years later there's a better tool, there's a better way of, of coming at it? Or yeah. is, is, is it more about bigger paradigm shifts? Is that is that maybe too utilitarian? Or, you know, the, the tools themselves are changing as the as the situation is changing. I mean, there are a number of ways that you could answer that. and I'm sure you will have seen different practitioners answer it in different ways. And of course, there's, you know, what do you mean by tools? Do you mean methodology or software tools? And the, the, what I would say is the thing which is most important is your fundamental methodology, how you understand people learn, how you carry that into the space of organizational learning and what, the ro- what our role is in order to enable and facilitate that to happen. It, it's, a bit like, you know, it's a bit like being an artist in that sense. The, 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 the thing you're trying to convey is an idea. You can do that through different media. You can use pen and ink or digital illustration or watercolor or, or acrylics, or you can just draw a picture in the sand. It, it, what's important is your understanding of how to tell the story. So... I get quite frustrated. I remember actually writing to the vice chancellor of one of the universities once because I, I'd had three graduates from that um, from that institution into my organisation, and all they seemed to come with was software skills. All they seemed to have done was teach them how to use a piece of software. They didn't have any concept of the critical thinking or the underlying methodology of learning, and that's the weakness for me. The most important thing is methodology. Everything else you can learn or you can buy or borrow. 
Um, but understanding fundamentally where you're coming from and how you are coming to it and how you enable and support people to learn is important. Well, understanding fundamentally where you're coming from, that really needs, uh, leads quite nearly into my next question, because you, you frequently describe yourself as a generalist. And so I wanted to ask you, what is, what is the common thread or, or the leading thread or the common core that, that you would say animates all that you do? If you sort of go back to first principles, where does it, where does it all come from? Because you are drawing on a range of disciplines, a range of methodology, a range of tools, and you're reiterating and experimenting so what what is sort of the bedrock would you say to your to your um, thinking and your practice well you know you, you say this coin with two sides so you could say curiosity or ignorance uh, I, I always like that you know terry pratchett one of my favorite authors used to say uh, you know something along the lines of learning is just you know carrying yourself up to a new platform of ignorance so moving your ignorance forward and that of course in different languages uh, the, the principle of western scientific methodology so um, it's hard to say what the bedrock is. I mean, I'm, I am. I don't know. I sometimes call myself an artist because I, you know, I draw things and paint things. I'm not, not. I'm not a particularly good artist. I'm not a terrible artist, but I'm not a particularly good artist. But I'm also, you know, a scientist by training. Um, I have a very deep interest in how things work. Probably more so social systems. How systems and structures work and I'm very interested in that through a range of different lenses the a common feature in my work and why I've ended up in this space somewhere between um, I don't work in academia but I don't work purely in organizations um, I, I, I ground my work in practice so most of my work can be carried into doing something about it the, the, the acid test for me is, can you do something with this on a wet Thursday afternoon at two o'clock? Because if I can't answer that question, then either I haven't done enough good thinking about it or it's just not that good as an idea. Not, not everything, you know, some stuff like this writing I was doing today about really broad ideas, the evolution of societal structures and organizations. You know, you can't do anything about that on Thursday afternoon, but most of it, you should be able to put into practice. You know, what does it mean? What can I do about it? What are other people doing about it? But it, it struck me that you're quite unusual in being interested in the very big picture about the whole nature of society and humanity, really, but also the, the wet Thursday afternoon question and how this actually interfaces with the, the reality. I'm going to stay with the big picture just for a minute, but we will definitely get to the wet Thursday afternoon. But if you, if you put um, social age thinking into Google, you come up at the top, so I'm presuming that that is your that is your coinage. That is an idea that you have um, developed, and I guess most people, if you ask them what age we're living in, would say the digital age or the technological age or the Anthropocene. So you're you're counterposing something different, and I wanted you to just explain a little bit because it seems to me that a lot of the things which flow thereafter in your work require some kind of understanding about what you mean by the, the, the social age and it, its character. Yeah, it's, it, you know, this is very simplistic thinking, really. And it, it, it may, you know, you, well, we'll see. I normally say that I write about the social age because, you know, I love technology and I'm very interested in where technology takes us. But that's precisely it. I'm interested in where it takes us. And where it takes us is into a different way of being human, a different way of being a person. We are connected to each other in different ways. We are able to be effective in different ways within organizations and structures that are evolving in certain ways. Almost all of it because of the technology. I just choose to focus the light slightly differently on the human social side of it. And sometimes when I describe the social age, I say, well, you could look around you and say, everything is almost exactly the same as it's always been. But you could also look around you and say, everything is almost entirely different than it has ever been in small but subtle ways. The ways that we buy things, the way we produce things, the things we belong to, the things we believe, the people we know and how we know them, how the world changes. All of this is different than it used to be. And if you add all that up, you either have to decide that it's an aberration. You either say fundamentally nothing's changed, we just have some more computers and Facebook, 
or you say fundamentally everything has changed and we just haven't quite clocked yet that it's different. You then couple that with a second idea, which I'm increasingly attracted to, which is to say it's worth remembering that pretty much everything is made up. You know, our human social structures, organisations, law courts, police forces, the ways that we farm, the ways that we run shops, markets themselves, money, it's all made up. It's not like gravity. You know, it's not innate. It's not natural. We have created these systems which really are essentially structures of power and control and effectiveness. And we've somehow come to believe they're real, but they're not. We can rewire them and rework them. You know, and I, it's, it's useful to remember that at every point, um, that the systems that served us well yesterday tell us precisely one thing, which is that they served us well yesterday. As the context continues to change, it is highly likely we will need new types of systems. So in the context of the social age, we will need new types of organisations. And that's what I'm interested in. Yeah. And you're interested, one of the, one of the um, aspects of that you're interested in is what kind of implications that has for leadership. What are the skills, the insights, the mindset that will enable leaders to, to cope with this and to, to work with it and to, to flourish in it. And I guess um, the, title, the titles of two of your most recent books give a sense perhaps of where your thinking is at in, in that regard. You've published Quiet Leadership and The Humble Leader uh, in, in, the, in the recent months. And you say in the latter, the, the humble leader, in the social age, leadership may need to be more humble than heroic and it will be the quiet voices that will lead and I guess people might look around the world and what they see is quiet voices tending to be more and more drowned out by those who shout the loudest and I wondered how 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 can well I guess how can leaders begin to think about what it means to be a humble leader quiet leadership um what I say in the intro to that work is that when organizations talk about leadership and change, they describe a journey of 10,000 steps. And this is the first three, but it's the steps that you and I can make today or this week. So quiet leadership and the humble leader work, that's all, it's basically just this week. It's nothing more grand. You could even say it's just today. It's very small, gentle work set in the, uh, I guess the backdrop of the organization as an ecosystem. This work is all illustrated through the landscape through the growth of a single tree and for the humble leader through a single leaf falling off the tree. And it's my most simple work. And in fact, it's my shortest work in many ways. The humble leader book is under three and a half thousand words long. It's barely a book. Um, and yet it took the longest to write. <laughs> so that work started in, in eight years ago, I think, with a, an essay written in San Francisco about social justice. It moved through a notion of the things that we give away and leaving with less and looking down. And it's ended up in work with no answers, but going on a journey. So it looks at humility, kindness, fairness, and a notion of grace, which actually came out of work I did around dance, around the choreography of dance, that's where that notion came from. It's not a religious use of the term grace. It's from graceful, graceful and fluid motion. How do we find graceful and fluid motion? Originally, in the manuscript form, that work was called imperfect leadership. It only became quiet leadership. It's really about how do we lead as imperfect humans within imperfect systems. And it, it seemed to me... It it was a, a provocation to think, you know, provocation in, in, in the best sense. It was a book which left space, literally and metaphorically, for the reader to, to think, to take some of the things you were suggesting on board. You, you know, you say you're happy if they reject some of them, you're happy if they tear out one or two of the pages in frustration, but yeah. at least you have sort of set it down there as something to, yeah, to engage with, I guess. I guess that's that's what you're hoping it achieves. I, I, absolutely. I'm very clear in that work. In The Humble Leader, it says very clearly, you know, there are no answer, there's no answers in this book. It's a guided reflection, and it's my guided reflection. 
So you should absolutely reject parts of it. I have on my desk, I have some pages that people have torn out and added notes to and sent back to me. And I love that, you know, like uh, you can find books that will tell you what to think and you can find plenty of people who will tell you what to think. Um, And I'm not interested in that because we have we have to figure out for ourselves what we're going to think. But what we can do is share the, the parameters. We can share the landscape that we are exploring. Uh, and that's what I try to do with that work. And you like the metaphor of a journey. And I guess, you know, you as you said, a thousand steps, and this is maybe just the, the first step. So it's, it's getting people started thinking about the direction of the journey, about the, the trajectory um, that, that that might take, I guess. Most often, it's very, very common that when I run sessions, I use increasingly simple methodologies and open spaces. And very often people say, I cannot remember the last time I had clear space, open space, white space to think in. And much of my work takes very simple ideas. When I First did the landscape of trust research, which is one of the biggest research projects in the world looking at trust. I remember thinking, this is going to take me 10 minutes. You know, it's not very complex. But the minute you open it up, you discover this thing you thought was a rock was a cloud. You know, we, we use the same word, but we mean a whole range of different things. And much of this work does that. It just takes apart the things that we're certain about and introduces space for uncertainty. How then do you begin to build that back up into something because obviously there's something which can be very positive and and enabling in allowing people to dismantle some of their old certainties but if they're left then with the pieces on the on the floor as it were that then they may not be actually better off than they were they may just have introduced uncertainty into their into their lives or their practice what what is the stage that comes after the questioning the dismantling of the old how do you then move forward. Well, that sort of tips us into the learning pillar of, of, of our work, which is about um, the role of disturbance in learning. And, you know, how do you introduce disturbance? How do you use that disturbance? But how do you ensure that people leave within a narrative of change? If you leave people with disturbance at the end, it's unsafe. If you introduce disturbance too early, you make it too safe too soon. So you have to give people the opportunity to make that journey. And in my work, you know, in my design and delivery of work, I use levels of narrative to do that. Personal narratives, co-created narratives and formal organisational narratives and exploring the tensions between them and then moving into looped practice, you know, action research cycles. So don't find the answer, but find an answer that's good enough for this cycle and then ensure you have the space, the provocation and the community to take it apart again and come back with a new answer for a new cycle. And crucially, share what you're doing. In the, in the uh, quiet leadership work, in that organisationless ecosystem, I say, you know, individually, we can each look after one part of that landscape. I can tend to one field and you can look after part of the forest and somebody can walk the path on the riverbank and pick up the litter. But in, unless we share something of our practice, those disparate activities, if, if the environment becomes polluted, if the water runs dry, we all suffer. And nobody individually can impose excellence on the system. Nobody can impose an answer. It has to be found and it has to be shared. We have to be able to um, find our story within a broader narrative. And I think that's how good learning happens. Yeah, I I thought what you what you wrote about storytelling in in various places was really interesting because I think storytelling can be kind of seized upon as an unalloyed good and the fact that that narratives can be narratives of power is sometimes downplayed or entirely overlooked and you you had a really interesting metaphor when you were you were you were contesting that kind of view of of narratives and you say the role is to capture the wisdom from within the tribal communities, not impart colonial wisdom into them. And you're using that obviously metaphorically, but I wondered if you could, you could say a little bit about this kind of, um, as it were, economy of, of narratives and storytelling and when, when that can be harnessed for good versus when it can actually uh, cause, cause problems and, and really reinforce sort of structures of power that are, that are not beneficial. Yeah. I mean, most of my work really just describes the mechanisms of systems. It doesn't describe good. Um, 
sometimes people sort of gleefully say to me, oh, well, you know, and what you've described, you know, Hitler could have been a social leader. Well, he seemed to amass a big following and, you know, in his terrible view of the world, get things done. So, of course, you know, I mean, this is simply describing the social forces of coming together and the, the way that opinion forms and changes. So there's nothing inherently good about it. But what we can start to recognise is the structures that our thinking takes place within. So we inhabit social tribal community structures within which we tend to believe that we are right, that we are good, that we have the view of the world. And conflict tends to lie between those types of structures. So to understand the way that scales up in organisations, in society, globally, is to understand how we come to live in a conflicted environment. Because, I mean, I'm an optimist, which may colour my thinking, but I think most people operate within a frame of reference where they understand they are the good people doing good things. I, I, I was working with a group recently who, who, who were stubbornly holding on to the notion that they were bad people. And, you know, there are people who I can tell you are bad, but it's a relative construct. It's my belief that they are bad. Again, it's not absolutely, you can't measure it. I can't cut somebody in half and tell you if they are good and bad. Um, we act according to that which seems right locally. And I, I should say, I recognize that some people have belief in religious systems that gives them absolute notions of good and bad. But still, that, you know, we have to recognize that people operate within that belief system. So often in conflict, you have two groups of people who would self-identify as being good and right coming together and yet creating an overall dynamic, which is bad and poor in its outcome. So how do we move beyond that? Most likely not by trying to impose a narrative on others, but to recognize um, dialogue through difference and dissent, what that looks like and why we often resist it. And that's challenging. It's an understatement. <laughs> As I said at the beginning, on this podcast, we're interested in exploring what constitutes strong learning and development within organisations. And I was really interested to see you wrote, a true learning organisation is one that is great to learn in, but which also learns itself. And so a very simple, pragmatic question. How rare are those? Um, it's not rare to find this in pockets. It's rare to find it overall. Organisations tend to entrust the important things to intuition. And that's very risky because it means things go well, they go well, they go well, and then they go appallingly badly. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, in my current research, I'm looking at experimentation and failure across 37 global organisations. And pretty much all of them describe methodologies and governance around experimentation doesn't mean they all do it well. About half of them self-identify that they can barely manage it at all, but they do at least have systems and processes. Not a single one of them has a methodology around failure. What they rely on is intuition, people thinking that they are doing something really well. And what that means is that you fail and it's fine and it's good and we learn and you fail and it's fine and it's good and we learn and you fail in a slightly different context and we execute you. So the experience of failure is highly erratic because it's intuitive, it's not consistent. And so our expectation of failure is governed more by this folklore of fear that surrounds us rather than by a hard edge that we can see and walk up close to. And I think that's an interesting thing that most of the forces that govern the social structure of the organization are highly relative. So trust and pride um, and fear and belonging and belief these things are highly subjective and often intuitive. We often don't look in detail at how they work. But, but in my work, I would say, you know, you, are, you have these two sides of the organisation. You have the formal structure and you have the social structure and you need both. But there's this dynamic tension between them. And if you had to ask which was the most important, I'd argue the social structure. Um, so you have to understand that in this tension, you cannot impose excellence. It's an emergent feature from the system. My sense is that failure is acceptable, or at least there's a rhetoric of failure being acceptable as long as it's learned from and you reiterate and 
and so on and the process can repeat and you can improve but there's a kind of there's a kind of I don't know, a, a delicate cartography of the circumstances in which it is actually acceptable to fail. And it may depend who you are and how you fail and how you present that failure. But actually, to, to slightly switch my metaphors, failure is a, is a bit of a minefield. And it's and from, from going from the sort of rhetorical position that it's OK to fail if you learn from your failures to actually people feeling, you know, as you were saying, safe enough to fail there is there is quite a big step is that something that you encounter and are there ways to sort of tackle that or begin to tackle that yeah i mean it, it, for me it, it falls into one of many categories where we say things which are pretty much inane you know we say things that just sort of sound good and sound like they're right but they bear no relevance to what happens in the real world so you, you know to say we you know, it's okay to fail, we learn from failure, is, is, is you know, to say everything and to say nothing at all. It's like, of course, you know, people fail, but they also expend an awful lot of effort in hiding that failure or doing it in private or doing it in, in social tribal trusted communities where you're not going to find out about it um, for very good reasons. You know, in general, it's a really, really bad idea to fail. It's a terrible idea to fail, you know, in, in key ways. You'll hurt yourself, you'll get fired, you'll invoke reputational consequence, you'll be judged, you'll be dismissed, you'll be belittled. I mean, you know, you should not be walking into a situation sort of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed saying, you know, it's going to be brilliant, I'm going to fail today and people are going to ostracise me because I'm a bad omen. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. But what we are right to say is that we learn through rapid prototyping and experimentation, the rehearsal and prototyping of new vocabulary and behaviour and ways of being. This, you know, this takes us into another of these inane things we say, you know, you should bring your whole self to work. That's crazy. You should definitely not bring your whole self to work. I mean, you know, I've got an eight month old daughter and nobody wants to see that version of me uh, when I'm trying to do something serious. But also we use different spaces to be different versions of ourselves to rehearse and develop ideas of different things. It's arguable whether there is even one self. So it sounds good. And we mean well by it. You know, most of this stuff we mean well by it. But we have to be a bit more pragmatic. So I would say there's not a space of experiment or don't experiment. There are different contexts of experimentation, and different ways of experimentation. And most of this is about finding ways where we can iterate, where we can sketch and sketch and redraw the organisation and redraw our practice. In fact, in my most recent work, work like Social Leadership Daily, which is about being in practice, I've got really interested in that notion. How do we take other people's brilliant ideas, form our version of the truth and put it into practice and build a community of people around us who can support us as we do so? And that feels like part of my work, which is starting to come together. I think it was in 2012, I wrote a book called Learning Knowledge and Meaning in Singapore about how we construct our sense of meaning. And today I'm approaching that from a completely different perspective, but it's still about how we construct our understanding of the world around us. But now it's much more about how do we do that in practice for 60 seconds today and again tomorrow and I really love that. You know, that to me feels quite quite pragmatic and mundane, but quite valuable for it. And because your method is exploratory and it's iterative and you you actually use the word vandalising, you sometimes you say vandalise your own earlier work. Does that make it difficult for people to know where to begin with you? Because you, I don't think you suppress your, you don't sort of repudiate and take down work that you've done in the past that you've maybe sort of moved on from or, or vandalised. So how, how does someone approach, because it's not monolithic, how does someone approach your work, would you say, to get the, the because there, I guess there is no essence, but it's a series of, of insights, or maybe it's paths to use your, your metaphor of the journey through a, through a forest or something. I, I write on a number of levels. So the blog is, is my first reflective space, daily, it runs through. I then tend to distill that into the guidebooks. I've got seven or eight of them at the moment, the Social Age guidebook series, which are about 10,000 words. They bring in the research and they have some sort of practical and applied ideas. 
And then the bigger books, which are more about the overarching ideas, the notion of social leadership, um, the notion of a socially dynamic organisation. So the, the people, you know, my most accessible work is, is probably things like the um, Community Builder Guidebook, the Trust Guidebook, which is just 72 questions around trust, the Social Learning Guidebook. Um, well, it's just, I think most of my work is um, accessible in that it's, <laughs> how can I say this? It's not written in dense academic language, and I hope it's not written in really rubbish um, sort of anodyne organisational language, but it's often quite confused um, because I'm figuring it out as well. I'm okay with that. You know, I'm perfectly okay being wrong. I, I, I spend a significant amount of my time talking about things I've been wrong about, um, and that's okay. You know, it's like, of course, I've been wrong about a ton of stuff. I'm pretty sure everybody has been wrong about a ton of stuff. Um, so yeah, and it's it, it's it's very refreshing to see someone being honest about it too, because it's less it's less common for people to be as honest about it as you. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I, sort of, I I say something to people sometimes when I'm working with them, they think I'm being sort of clever or funny, and I'm not. I I I just tell them to sort of stop and think. How desperate must they be if they're talking to me about this stuff? Because you know, there's plenty of really big global companies that tell you that they've got answers to all of this stuff. And they should know. I mean, they've got hundreds and hundreds of people and millions and millions of pounds, and they do all this research. And they seem pretty sure that they're right. And, you know, we operate at a tiny scale all over the world in different contexts. And we ramble on and we draw pictures and we talk about this nonsense. And, you know, I say, just stop and think, you know, what does it say about you and your organization that you're, you're engaging with these ideas? You have to, you know, you have to make this fundamental decision. Are we like pirates searching for treasure? Is that what we're doing at the moment? There is an out there, an answer out there. Somebody buried it. Let's go dig it up. Then we've solved the problem. We never need to talk about it again. Or are we making the journey? Because if you're making the journey, I'm pretty handy to have along for that because I can stumble around and draw a map and, you know, I know how to light a fire. If you're looking for that pot of gold, you know, that's not going to be what you're going to find. Um, and we have to think about that for ourselves. What does it mean to be in practice? How are we going to build the types of organisations that we need? Because I'm pretty sure it's not the type we had yesterday. And I'm pretty sure it's not in a book that somebody wrote 20 years ago that doesn't appear to have delivered the answer yet. So how are we going to find it unless we find ways to build it together, search for it together and scrape our knees as we go? Julian, I'm really enormously grateful to you for answering so many questions in such a short space of time, questions big and small uh, and appearing on the, on the podcast. Um, just a reminder that viewers can find other episodes of the podcast on YouTube and you can listen to it as well on all the usual podcast platforms. Um, to see how Humentum can help you with your nonprofit LMS and e-learning needs, visit the Humentum website, humentum.org forward slash training. And I hope you'll join us again for another podcast very soon. And until then, thank you very much for watching. And thanks especially to Julian for being with us today. And goodbye.